Early on the morning of November 15, four transports arrived at Espiritu Santo with wounded sailors and marines from Guadalcanal. One of the transports, the President Jackson, carried seven seriously burned men from the San Francisco who did not survive the trip. Admiral Turner's Macaulay was among this newly arrived group too. Shortly after his arrival, he sent an aide to summon the acting commander of the San Francisco. Lieutenant Commander Shonland took the Helena's motor whaleboat to the Macaulay and was met at the gangway by Turner's flag lieutenant, who promptly told Shonland that his superior wanted to see not him, but the officer who was on the San Francisco's bridge during the battle. The boat returned to the cruiser and came back with McCandless, who met with Turner and tendered his report. The San Francisco continued to Noumea, where Admiral Halsey came aboard to inspect the damage and give tribute to his men. Shonland met him at the top of the gangway. The damage control officer must have recovered some of the pride he had lost after Kelly Turner's rebuff, when Halsey gripped him by the shoulders and said, Men like you, Shonland, are going to win this war. Chick Morris, the young officer from the Helena, went into Noumea town, he wrote. We did the shops where under the cross of Lorraine, the insignia of the free French government, you could buy almost anything American. And so before long we were outside the town proper and climbing a hill that overlooked the harbour. It was damned good to be walking on solid ground again. You went slowly, appreciating every step, almost tasting the earth with your feet through the soles of your shoes. All those days, weeks, months of ocean, and now something brown and firm that you could pick up in your fingers and look at, that you could feel and smell. And because it wouldn't last, you have the most aching desire to keep walking, 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 just to feel it under your feet. He then found a small Catholic church high on a hilltop. An old lady knelt praying at the altar where candles burned. Morris took a seat in a pew and lost track of time. Down below in the harbour, our ship lay quietly at anchor after slugging her way through a large part of the Japanese fleet, and we owed it to her and ourselves, I felt, to kneel for a moment and say thanks. How long I stayed there I don't remember. Not long, probably. I prayed, I think. I knelt and thought of guns thundering in the dark, of ships burning and men shouting as they leapt into the oily water. A prayer of thanks and gratitude was hidden somewhere in those thoughts, if not put into words. And I was on my knees, whether praying or not, when I became aware of the sunlight again. I looked up at the windows, and one in particular held my attention. You looked at it because you had to, because in a strange way it beckoned. From where Morris sat, the streaming sunlight clearly illuminated the inscription on the glass, beneath a haloed figure whose face and outstretched hands shimmered with light. It read, St. Helena. Men like this would win the war, and Admiral Halsey appreciated it. But as he reviewed the circumstances of the Juno's loss, he found his anger rising. Why hadn't Captain Hoover stopped to rescue survivors? Halsey was arriving at some severe conclusions about the Helena skipper's suitability to command. He ordered him to report to his headquarters. Hoover's decorations included two Navy crosses, with a third to follow after the events of Friday the 13th were duly considered. His destroyers had braved massive explosions at Coral Sea to save survivors of the sinking Lexington. His ship had been instrumental in two naval victories, but when Halsey got wind of what had happened, not even the sympathy and concurrence of Admiral Nimitz himself would save him. Despite this officer's magnificent combat record, I questioned him very thoroughly in the presence of Miles Browning and a Vice Admiral, and my opinion that he had made an error in judgment was strengthened. I later visited his ship and thought I sensed a deterioration of morale. I called a conference of a Vice Admiral and Rear Admiral and my Chief of Staff and discussed this matter. They concurred in the opinion I had formed, in that this cruiser skipper was no longer fit for command in his then condition. I accordingly detached him from his ship and ordered him to report to Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet. So wrote Halsey in a manuscript draft of his memoirs, at least. In the revised and published account, it was no longer he who interrogated Hoover. That job fell to his advisers, Jake Fitch, Kelly Turner and Bill Calhoun, he said. They determined that Hoover had done wrong and recommended his detachment. Reluctantly, I concurred, Halsey wrote. I felt that the strain of prolonged combat had impaired his judgment, that guts alone were keeping him going, and that his present condition was dangerous to himself and to his splendid ship. 
In this conviction, I detached him with orders to Commander-in-Chief, Pacific Fleet. The sympathetic concern Halsey professed for the captain's well-being was not borne out by the severity of his remedy. Halsey would regret that remedy soon enough. When the Juno's last raft was finally located on the open sea, it contained but a single survivor, Alan Hayne. He was built like a weightlifter, a strapping young man with a broad face and black hair and a gap between his front teeth. Brought aboard the seaplane tender ballad, he didn't need long to regain his senses and tell his grim story, though a shark had done its best to remove all witnesses, taking a fist-sized bite out of his left buttock. Three more survivors, Joseph Hartney, Victor James Fitzgerald and Lieutenant Charles Wang, found by a seaplane, had the good fortune to reach San Cristobal under propulsion of a heavy squall that had foiled several attempts by Catalina flying boats to land and retrieve them. With Wang severely wounded and delirious, Hartney and Fitzgerald had sustained themselves with good seamanship by singing Irish folk songs and by the imperative to tend faithfully to their gravely wounded shipmate. When their raft entered a lagoon on San Cristobal, they scarcely had the strength to paddle ashore. At ebb tide, they grounded themselves on a coral ledge and slept. When they awoke, the tide was carrying them the rest of the way in, and on the white sand beach where they landed was a freshwater stream that literally saved their lives. Found by natives, they passed into the care of a German-born copra planter who had no love for the Japanese. On the 19th, a Catalina pilot reported ten men in a raft at 11 to 13 south, 11 to 59 east. Several ships were sent for them, and six men were rescued from rafts that originally held 30. The final tally of Juno survivors stood at 10 after the sinking, not including O'Neill and the three corpsmen transferred to the San Francisco. Killed or forever missing were 683 men of a crew of almost 700, as a Navy Department official would explain to a bereaved relative, efforts consistent with the paramount tactical necessities of the time were made to rescue as many survivors as possible. That these efforts were not successful in the case of many gallant officers and men is deeply regretted by the Navy. For the Japanese, it was becoming increasingly clear that Guadalcanal had become their Stalingrad. That was the opinion of Matome Ugaki. And though all such comparisons are inexact, there was no denying that in their zeal to advance the Japanese had stretched themselves beyond the nourishment of their supply train and exposed themselves against an enemy who was proving to be absolutely implacable in defence. The extent of the disaster of the previous two nights was now in full view. When Kondo's procession of cripples returned to Truk Harbour on November 17, Ugaki was watching from the decks of the Yamato. It was lonely indeed that we couldn't see Hie and Kirishima among them, he wrote in his diary. When Hiroaki Abe came on board the Yamato, he looked crestfallen. With a bandage swathing his lower jaw, he sorrowfully reported the loss of two ships. As Ugaki saw it, he seemed to suffer especially for his sunken Hie. He even confided that he thought he would have been better to have gone down with Hie. I can well appreciate how he felt. A fiction, however, was concocted to keep spirits up. Morale was lifted as it became almost certain, as a result of an investigation conducted by the advance force, that two or three enemy battleships had been sunk, Ugaki wrote in his diary. For the first time, a pattern was set. The proud IJN was reduced to consoling itself with fantasy. Ashore, the Marines would learn that their Japanese opponents had been informed that New York and San Francisco had fallen to Japanese invasion forces. The Juno's survivors were still fighting the descent into madness at sea, when Kelly Turner wrote Halsey to recommend a posthumous Medal of Honor for Dan Callaghan, who, by his daring determination and tactical brilliance, prevented the Japanese from accomplishing their mission. Turner wanted the slain admiral decorated for distinguishing himself conspicuously by gallantry and intrepidity at the risk and cost of his life above and beyond the call of duty. Similar recommendations, duly acted on in time, were made for Bruce McCandless and Herbert Shonland for bringing the San Francisco through the maelstrom that night. Turner wrote that the behaviour of the ship's company is beyond praise, not only for bravery but also for effectiveness for fighting their ship well and effectively, for bravery beyond the call of duty. And for outstanding performance in action on November 12 to 13, 
I recommend that the San Francisco be the first vessel in the Navy to receive the citation announced by Alnav 238 for outstanding ship. Navy Secretary Frank Knox wrote to Halsey two days later, Speaking for the Navy as a whole, I want to express to you the feeling of pride and satisfaction the entire service feels in the great victory won by you and your men. Halsey replied, My deep thanks for your inspiring message. I am passing it on to the heroic men who did our fighting. SOPAC officers and men of the Army, Navy and Marine Corps recognize no division into separate services. We are all in the United States service here. As commander of that service in this area, I gratefully accept your tribute to its heroes with a sense of humility for myself and great pride for them. Nimitz wrote, We have admiration beyond expression for the unswerving offensive spirit of your fighting forces and their ability to strike down the enemy while absorbing his blows. We regret deeply the losses you had to take, but they were gloriously not in vain. For the Marines on the canal, Frank Jack Fletcher's decision to withdraw the carriers seemed a lifetime ago. The Marine Corps' final verdict on the fighting Navy's importance to the campaign was rendered by the general who stood with his men since the first landings, Archie Vandergrift. We believe the enemy has suffered a crushing defeat. We thank Lee for his sturdy effort last night. We thank Kincaid for his intervention yesterday. Our own aircraft have been grand in its relentless pounding of the foe. Those efforts we appreciate, but our greatest homage goes to Scott, Callahan, and their men, who with magnificent courage against seemingly hopeless odds, drove back the first hostile stroke and made success possible. To them, the men of Cactus lift their battered helmets in deepest admiration. The Navy had earned nothing less. When it was all said and done at Guadalcanal, three sailors would die at sea for every infantryman who fell ashore. In a speech to the New York Herald Tribune Forum on November 17, President Roosevelt lamented the loss of his former naval aide, Dan Callahan. During the past two weeks, FDR said, we have had a great deal of good news and it would seem that the turning point in this war has at last been reached. On the 19th, Major General Alexander M. Patch, the commander of the U.S. Army's American Division, and the successor to General Vandergrift, arrived on Guadalcanal and delivered the best gift the 1st Marine Division ever received during their tenure in the South Pacific. The news that their tour of duty was near an end. On board the San Francisco, Halsey decorated many of the crew who had distinguished themselves, Jack Bennett among them. As the Lieutenant Junior Grade's name was called, Halsey said into the standing mic, Step closer, son. The words reverberated through the public address system. When Halsey fixed the Navy cross onto his shirt, its sharp pin stuck into Bennett's flesh, and Bennett was keenly aware of the microphone inches from his mouth. I knew that any sound of pain I uttered would also boom out over the speakers, Bennett wrote. I was already scared, and now I had to grit my teeth and remain silent as the Admiral continued trying to close the clasp, finally giving up when he saw the blood seeping through my shirt. The repair supervisors at Noumea, determining that the Sterret needed structural work, made plans to send her back to Pearl. No sooner had the repair team left, Cal Calhoun wrote, than we were told that Admiral Halsey himself was coming aboard to inspect our damage. No one could have failed to recognise the bushy eyebrows, the strong chin, or the direct gaze that bespoke confidence and strength. He shook hands with each of us, Calhoun wrote, and asked to be shown all of our battle damage. Halsey listened intently as Captain Coward catalogued the cost, human and material, extracted by each hit. From time to time he simply shook his head as we described events, Lieutenant Calhoun wrote. By the end of the briefing, Halsey had tears in his eyes. In a low voice, he told Coward and his senior officers how proud he was of them. I wish I could recall his exact words, Calhoun wrote, but I do remember some of his thoughts, he regretted that he had to send destroyers against battleships, but was sure that the small ships would do their utmost. He was amazed that any destroyer could absorb eleven shell hits and still steam away from the action under her own power. He was profoundly moved by the many stories of heroism, and by the mute but eloquent evidence of punishment and sacrifice that was apparent at every turn as he toured the ship. Finally, he thanked us, with a sincerity that added a special quality to his words, and said, God bless you. We stood there filled with admiration, respect and pride, and watched him climb into a waiting jeep and drive off.
It was an unforgettable once-in-a-lifetime occasion. To those of us who witnessed it, Admiral Halsey's name will always lead the list of inspirational combat leaders of World War II. On November 22, Admiral Halsey shared his thinking with Nimitz concerning his decision to relieve Gil Hoover. After analysis of the situation presented, I consider that the commanding officer, Helena, senior officer present in the task group, committed a serious and costly error in the action which he took. Specifically, he should have made radio report of the torpedoing at once. Radio silence, as a measure of concealment, had ceased to be effective since the enemy was in contact. Only positive action to keep him submerged could be expected to delay his report. Secondly, he should have instituted offensive action, together with, or closely followed by, rescue operations, utilising at least one of his destroyers. His failure to take prompt action on the above lines was further aggravated by lack of any follow-up to ensure that senior commands were informed of the Juno's loss. Commander South Pacific was first apprised of this fact as a result of his own inquiry into Juno's status when she was not included in the arrival report of the group. In view of the above circumstances, I have this date relieved Captain G.C. Hoover of his command of the USS Helena and ordered him by dispatch to proceed by the first available government air transportation and report to Commander-in-Chief for reassignment. Canny, cautious and discerning, Admiral Spruance picked up on an assumption that underlay Halsey's censure, that Hoover had had the means at hand to attack the enemy submarine. He asked Hoover for comment, asking specifically whether his two destroyers had functioning sonar systems. Hoover conceded that both the Fletcher and Sterrett had working sound gear, though the latter was badly damaged. He added that he felt the need to bring damaged ships safely home outweighed the uncertain gain of searching for survivors of a vessel that had exploded so violently. Hoover emphasised the dangerous nature of the waters he was transiting, pointing to the dispatch the Juno sent him that morning, notifying him of the threat of enemy aircraft, and urging him to ask for prompt support from the Enterprise Task Force. He mentioned that neither the Helena nor the San Francisco had planes on board to hunt submarines, but the merits of arguments no longer mattered, the fix was in. According to Bin Cochran of the Helena, the brawling and ill-tempered Captain Miles Browning, Halsey's chief of staff, had argued fiercely for Hoover's relief, and later bragged about having Hoover sacked. Cochran, like most of his shipmates, held Hoover in high esteem for the cool-headed manner in which he had led the ship through two ferocious actions. Browning impressed people less. Even Chester Nimitz's moderating voice couldn't overcome the damning effect of Halsey's memo. As reports and memoranda proceed up the Navy's chain of command, commanders are given the chance to add their own comments or endorsements for the benefit of higher-ups. In his December 4th endorsement to Admiral King's copy of the memo, Nimitz acknowledged the difficult trial Hoover faced, confronted with a hard decision in perilous waters. He stated that the failure of the B-17 to report the loss of the Juno in time was not Hoover's fault. Referring to sighting reports Hoover had received of enemy carriers, surface ships and submarines nearby, he wrote, Under these conditions, the situation confronting Captain Hoover was one in which the necessity for getting his damaged ships back to a base was balanced against the natural instinct of every naval officer to go to the rescue of officers and men in distress and danger. Whatever may be the opinion of Captain Hoover's decision in this matter, he was the responsible officer on the spot and, from his war record, which includes two important night engagements, his courage may not be questioned. Breaking with Halsey, Nimitz recommended that King give Hoover a suitable command at sea, after some time to rest. It didn't matter. In the competitive political world of the Admiralty, written criticism from an area commander was inerasable, a terminal act. Halsey's impulsive disgust could not be unwritten, not by the Pacific Ocean Area Commander-in-Chief, and not even by Halsey himself, after he later admitted that he had acted unjustly and in haste. The variances in Halsey's written accounts of his evaluation of Hoover's performance are curious. In his memoirs, he offered a confession of a grievous mistake. I concluded that I had been guilty of an injustice. Commander-in-Chief Pacific Fleet was in disagreement with me on my judgment, wondering if I had done an injustice to a man who had had a magnificent combat record, I was finally convinced that this man at the time in question was suffering from an aggravated case of combat fatigue, 
and that his guts alone had kept him going. I wrote an official letter stating my belief that this officer had been suffering from combat fatigue at that time and that I had possibly committed an error of judgment in detaching him under such drastic circumstances. I requested that he be given a combatant command and stated that I should be delighted to have him in such a position under my command. I am afraid that my late action in attempting to clear this officer of the stigma that resulted from my detaching him had not been successful, although it most certainly alleviated his feelings. I am deeply regretful of the whole incident. I have already acknowledged my mistake to him and to the Navy Department, and here I acknowledge it publicly. It is a tribute to the calibre of this officer that our personal relations are excellent. In Nimitz's careful handling of the Hoover question, Halsey must have eventually seen the virtue of restraint in second-guessing combat commanders. Still, the Navy felt the need to arbitrate questions of culpability for defeat, even during wartime. Just as the Guadalcanal campaign was turning its way, it was preparing to launch an investigation into the causes of the fiasco that was the Battle of Savo Island. Dan Callahan and Norman Scott, in death, had shown an aggressive style that would carry the Navy's surface forces to victory. Willis Lee continued in that spirit, refining the state of the art with his battleships. They and their fighting sailors had stopped the Tokyo Express cold in November. Still, there was plenty of fodder for recrimination, for the surface fleet's first victories were won despite many avoidable errors. Admiral Pai, from his billet as president of the Naval War College, criticised Callaghan's preparations and dispositions. Orders such as give them hell, and we want the big ones make better newspaper headlines than they do battle plans. A study of the naval actions so far in this war gives the impression that such successes as we have had have been largely due to the individual excellence of our ships and their crews, and not to exceptionally good use made of them by the commanders. Sharp words flew about what commanders did and should have done, but in death Scott and Callaghan were spared the indignity of inquiry. Concerning Callaghan's performance, Pye finally concluded, There is no telling what might have been. In this case we seem to have got some of the breaks of luck that the enemy got in the Battle of Savo Island. On the other hand, we seem to have repeated some of the errors, even exaggerated them, made a month earlier in the Battle of Cape Esperance. The victories of November added new complexity to the arguments in Washington about where America's principal worldwide axis of effort should lie, and opened up new avenues of possibility to take the offensive against the Japanese. Nimitz and MacArthur would long argue how best to exploit these. On October 24, as the Battle of Santa Cruz was looming, President Roosevelt had said a diversion of resources to hold Guadalcanal was needed to take advantage of our success. Pressured by both Admiral King and General Marshall not to neglect the Pacific, we cannot permit the present critical situation in the southwest Pacific to develop into a second Bataan, they wrote. Roosevelt agreed to a cutback of forces flowing to England. As Major General Thomas T. Handy of the U.S. Army General Staff confided to General Marshall, our main amphibious operations in 1943 are likely to be in the Pacific, and called the argument about Germany first, or Japan first, largely academic. Now, one of the Army's foremost strategists, Lieutenant General Stanley Embick, provided a forceful rationale for abandoning the worldwide strategy long held to, at least in name, by the American and British commands. He pointed out on November 20 that under the pre-war ABC-1 agreement, Britain was supposed to take first responsibility for the Far East theatre, while the US fleet diverted Japan by threatening its flank. In reality, of course, those two roles were inverted. In line with the realities of geography and heavy industry, the Americans had taken the lead in their Western Ocean, and the fact of that leadership, Embick believed, changed everything. Having assumed this commitment, the US must therefore maintain their position as a first charge, he wrote. With even army leaders advocating a Pacific First strategy, the state of joint strategic planning was tenuous at best. Far from solving any problems, the diverse opinion within the army allowed the old arguments among the services and among the Allies to gain new fervor. The lack of a consensus within American ranks effectively left Germany first to exist only in the minds of politicians. The numbers spoke for themselves. At the end of 1942, the United States would field nearly 25% more combat troops in the Pacific 
than it did in England and North Africa, 464,000 to 378,000. The gap between Roosevelt's words and his military's work caused Britain's service chiefs to lament the very idea of combined planning with their Atlantic cousins. Their best insurance against America pursuing a full-on Pacific First strategy was Churchill's friendship with Roosevelt. If Japan was traumatised by the bulldog savagery of the American defence of Guadalcanal, the British didn't care much for its implications either. On the morning of November 23, Halsey wrote to his commanders to describe the array of new naval forces flowing into the South Pacific. The Saratoga was coming back. With the anti-aircraft cruiser San Juan and a squadron of destroyers, she would reform the nucleus of Task Force 11. The Enterprise, with the anti-aircraft cruiser San Diego and Hoover's old Desron II, would continue to comprise Task Force 16. Lee, shorn of the South Dakota now but soon to be given two more fast battleships, the repaired North Carolina and the brand new Indiana, flew Task Force 64's flag in the Washington. With the fuel oil bottleneck finally easing, two older battleships, the Maryland and Colorado, would come south as Task Force 65 under Rear Admiral Harry W. Hill. Rear Admiral Thomas Kincaid, whom Halsey relieved of command of Task Force 16 because a better qualified aviation man, Rear Admiral Frederick C. Sherman was available, would take the cruiser striking force, Task Force 67, with the heavies Northampton, Pensacola, New Orleans, the light cruisers Honolulu and Helena, and six destroyers. Task Force 66 came into being as well, with eight destroyers. Five days later, Halsey announced their new strategic objective, Rabaul. He wrote MacArthur saying that New Guinea couldn't be secured until the Japanese strongpoint in the Bismarcks was under American control. He also staked the Navy's claim to the job, arguing that the attack against Rabaul must be amphibious along the Solomons with New Guinea land position, basically a supporting one only. I am currently reinforcing Cactus position and expediting means of operating heavy air from there. It is my belief that the sound procedure at this time is to maintain as strong a land and air pressure against the Japanese Buna position as your lines of communication permit and continue to extract a constant toll of Japanese shipping, an attrition which if continued at the present rate he can not long sustain. The attrition wasn't easy on the Americans either. Even with the new naval units on hand, Halsey's plan to surge toward Rabaul, much like MacArthur's similar concept earlier that year, seemed ambitious with the limited amphibious resources he had immediately at hand. In late November, Halsey received his fourth star, elevating him from vice-admiral to admiral. When it was discovered that Noumea was short of four-star pins for his epaulets, the Navy obtained a pair of two-star pins from a Marine Major General and had them reconfigured by a repair ship's welding shop. After Vice Admiral William L. Calhoun presented Halsey with the makeshift four-star insignia, Halsey turned in his three-star pins and said, Send one of these to Mrs. Scott and the other to Mrs. Callahan. Tell them it was their husband's bravery that got me my new ones. Whatever else could be said of William F. Halsey, no one would complain that he didn't lead from the front. He had felt the concussion of Japanese gunfire, and as November came to an end, the Japanese would demonstrate that they had a few good salvos left in them. They had not yet given up on Jack London's least favourite island. After the steel mauling battles of November, both fleets were left to improvise. The night of November 30 December, one saw the first attempt by the Tokyo Express to deliver supplies using drums lashed together with ropes. Destroyers would steam in close to shore, then drop the drums overboard for small craft to retrieve for the troops. Rear Admiral Raizo Tanaka was the architect of the new approach. In the face of the daily distress calls from the supply-straightened Japanese garrison on Guadalcanal, the officers of Destroyer Squadron 2 were resigned to the new role forced upon them. Tanaka's chief of staff, Commander Yasumi Toyama, lamented bitterly, Ah, we are more a freighter convoy than a fighting squadron these days, the damn Yankees have dubbed us the Tokyo Express. We transport cargo to that cursed island, and our orders are to flee rather than fight. What a stupid thing. For the crews of fighting ships, the life of the blockade runner was a strenuous and unsatisfying routine. On November 27, Tanaka steamed south from the shortlands on a high-speed convoy run. Their sortie was not long a secret. 
Quickly, the American patrol planes spied them from above the clouds. Eight destroyers, six serving as transports, laden with supplies, magazines at half capacity, carrying eight torpedoes instead of the usual sixteen, to save on weight. Planning for its reception was well along. As Tanaka was leaving Rabaul, Rear Admiral Thomas Kincaid was sitting down to apply the knowledge the surface fleet had purchased with the lives of more than 4,000 men to date. He was rewriting Task Force 67's operations plan. Op Plan 142 applied recent experience methodically. The confusions of early battles would be banished by forethought. Ship captains would know what to do automatically. Certain procedures would be established and used by default. The task force would be organised and deployed to reflect a best practices approach to battle. Norman Scott's improvised doctrine of night battle would be refined, encoded as doctrine, and circulated for general use. Except for the use of the radar, whose virtues were now well recognised, the new doctrine sounded a lot like what the Japanese had been doing from the start. As the enemy was scouted by radar, the destroyers would surge forward independently at first contact to make a surprise torpedo attack. Then, as the time of their impact came, the cruisers, till then standing off at more than 12,000 yards, would open fire while their aircraft lazed overhead dropping flares. If targets were lost, star shells could be used, but searchlights were strictly forbidden. All that was needed to turn the plan to a victory were more good ships and another cast of sailors willing to risk their lives to put ordnance on target first. As the ships most recently assigned to Task Force 67 licked their wounds and headed home for repair, as new steel plates replaced those shattered in battle, a new task force came together at Espiritu Santo. Its haphazard nature was, once again, a reflection of the perpetual emergency besetting Admiral Halsey. He would refer to its composition as a compromise dictated by necessity. Cruisers were borrowed from carrier task forces, destroyers from convoy assignment. They would be the same men who had lined the rails at Espiritu Santo and given the San Francisco a thunderous cheer. They came together at the end of November as a reconstituted Task Force 67 and made ready to fend off the Tokyo Express once again. At Naval Base Guadalcanal, Lloyd Mustin and his operations team were working on the fly too, trying to find a way to better use the daring but undisciplined PT boat force assigned to the area. The squadron now had 15 boats, up from just four a few weeks earlier, but given the fluid and occasionally slipshod organisation at Tulagi, Mustin found it hard to coordinate their sorties with the other naval forces in the area. Some destroyer commanders resisted involving their tin cans with the hooligan navy, mainly out of fear that it would be difficult to keep from stepping on one another's toes. I thought we had better improve that, Mustin said, or somebody was going to get hurt. Having seen the value of the intelligence that PT skippers acquired during their patrols in Savo Sound, Mustin chose, in the name of better cooperation, a PT boatman as his assistant operations officer. They figured out how many boats were available nightly, determined how frequently they could be used, set up patrol schedules, and began innovating new approaches to attacking the Japanese submarines and destroyers in the waters off Guadalcanal. Finding that Japanese destroyers could catch and run down PT boats on a clear night, he settled on a game of cat and mouse. The young PT boat officers learned to avoid being silhouetted in open water while avoiding flat water that would show their wakes, and to attack using diversions, with some boats working as decoys while boats closer to shore rushed in. As they changed their schemes, the Japanese did too. On the night of November 30, however, the PT boats were ordered to stay put at Tulagi. Something larger than they were cut out for was brewing that night. It was another run of the Tokyo Express, eight destroyers under Rear Admiral Tanaka. A large American force was gathering at Espiritu Santo to intercept him. True to form, the Navy, on the eve of the mission, replaced Kincaid with a new commander. Kincaid balked at his reassignment from a carrier task force and wanted no further part of the South Pacific. And so, as Dan Callahan had supplanted Norman Scott, as Cassin Young and Joe Hubbard had relieved Charles McMorris and Mark Crowter on the San Francisco, Rear Admiral Carlton Wright now became the officer in tactical command of Task Force 67. Long of service in the South Pacific but new to surface combat, Wright flew his flag in the newly arrived Minneapolis, 
leading a scratch team of four other cruisers. The New Orleans, Pensacola, Honolulu and Northampton. These newcomers to the Iron Bottom sound surface striking force, most of them reassigned from carrier escort duty, were a bit like replacement troops going forward to the front lines from rear area anti-aircraft battalions. They wore the same uniforms and wielded the same weapons, but they weren't wise in the bitter discipline of close combat. None of the four cruisers had had any part in the four surface actions fought in Savo Sound to this point. It could not be said, either, that they were commanded by the officer best equipped to prepare them for that new type of fight. The only surface force flag officer alive who had fought and beaten the Japanese Navy, Willis Lee, was back in port with his squadron, tending to the Washington at Noumia. Though both were veteran cruiser commanders, neither Kincaid nor Wright had fought a night action before, nor executed a tactical plan such as they were now designing. They departed Espiritu Santo's second channel anchorage at 11.30pm on November 29, following a van composed of the destroyers Fletcher, Drayton, Maury and Perkins. When they reached the eastern entrance to Lengo Channel at 9.40 the next night, Wright's task force encountered some friendly transports. Augmenting his tag team, Halsey ordered two of their escorts, the Lamson and Lardner, to fall in astern the Northampton, and so another pickup squad with fresh leadership and big ideas headed north toward its destiny. The Fletcher, with its modern SG radar, rode at the head of the line. If this was an improvement over Callaghan's approach two weeks before, the urge to hesitate would once again rise as a plague. According to the Fletcher's executive officer, Lieutenant Joseph C. Wiley, about the last visual dispatch we got before dusk settled in were instructions stating not to commence firing without permission. Wiley was on the radar when strange contacts began to register. The first one appeared to the radar officer in the Minneapolis like a small wart on Cape Esperance which grew larger and finally detached itself from the outline of the land mass. As Tanaka's force steamed within range of the American microwaves, Wiley reported their bearing, course and speed to the other destroyers. With torpedoes ready, he radioed Wright, request permission to fire torpedoes. Wiley would call the task force commander's response, the most stupid thing that I have ever heard of. It was a single word, no. Wright deemed the range too long. For four critical minutes, Wright mulled the Black Knight from the bridge of the Minneapolis. When he finally granted permission to the destroyers to fire their torpedoes, the radar showed that their targets had already passed them abeam, leaving the American missiles to pursue them from astern, a fruitless waste of fighting power. When Wright ordered the cruisers to open fire less than a minute after the destroyers had let fly, surprise became a casualty of impulsiveness, and what ensued was another confused free-for-all. As cruiser gunfire obliterated the senses, Wright lost sight of his targets behind the walls of water raised in front of them by American guns. The spectacle was familiar to men observing from the beach. Lloyd Mustin and the others at Captain Greenman's headquarters saw great flashes of light that were too large to be mere gun discharges. They didn't know whose ships were out there bursting into flames, and there would be no knowing till morning. Suddenly and anticlimactically, Mustin's radio went silent. The sober messages that trickled into Radio Guadalcanal over the next couple of hours told the story. From the Minneapolis came a dispatch before dawn that she had been torpedoed and was underway for longer at half a knot. The Pensacola weighed in with a similar report. Then Admiral Wright raised Greenman, asking, Can you send boats towards Savo? The implications of the request were clear enough. Mustin instructed the Bobolink and four PT boats to sweep the sound, while Wright's second-in-command, Rear Admiral Mallon S. Tisdale, ordered the destroyers to assist damaged cruisers northwest of Lunga Point. Wright then passed along a fuller report of the shattering damage inflicted on his task force and asked him to send it to Halsey. The news of the rout was shocking to anyone who believed the fleet was at last on the path to victory. Wanting a clearer picture, Captain Greenman ordered Mustin to go up as an airborne observer to survey the sound. Racing to Henderson Field at dawn, the Atlanta survivor climbed into the rear seat of a Dauntless. The Marine pilot checked him out on the dive bomber's twin-mounted Brownings, and they took to the skies. Gaining altitude over Iron Bottom Sound, Mustin could see no ships anywhere. He raised the PT boat headquarters at Tulagi, but the Mosquito fleet didn't know much either. 
Several long turns over the waters south of Savo yielded no clues until the morning sun reached the proper angle to the water, and then he saw it, a wide sprawling oil slick trailing away to the west with the friction of an eight-knot wind. It marked the resting place of yet another American ship in what some would call the Savo Navy Yard, or Iron Bottom Sound. Her identity would be established soon enough. It was the Northampton, gutted by torpedoes fired by Tanaka's surprised but quick-triggered destroyer commanders. When Wright's cruisers opened fire, they erred in concentrating on a single ship, the destroyer Takanami, riding ahead of Tanaka's group as a picket. As American projectiles straddled her and she returned fire, the cruiser's salvos, drawn to the light, converged in earnest. With memories still haunting the Japanese of what the Washington and South Dakota had wrought 15 days before, it was easy for Tanaka to believe the American force included battleships. Surprised but resilient, Tanaka ordered all commanders, Belay supply schedule, all ships, prepare to fight. The crews cast loose as many supply drums as they could when they brought their batteries to bear. Shielded by the flames of the Takanami, much as the Washington had been masked by the burning destroyers a few weeks before, Tanaka accelerated to full speed and ordered a course reversal that brought his column running parallel to his targets. His destroyers proceeded to let loose with one of the most lethal torpedo salvos of the war. From on high in the rear seat of a Dauntless, Mustin could see the evidence of the swarm of fish that had beset Task Force 67. Washed up on Guadalcanal's northern beaches and Savo Island, their long forms lay at angles on the sand. Many were shiny and new, recently run aground. A great many more of both American and Japanese origin had decayed to rust, long of residence ashore. Their numbers spoke to the great volume of underwater ordnance loosed in both directions in these waters over the past few months. Amid the flotsam on the sea below, Mustin could make out the workaday paraphernalia of US Navy shipboard life, powder cases, wooden shoring, life rafts, donut rings, and wreckage of varied kinds. There were a great many sailors in the water too, and many more waved from the shores of Savo. The PT boats were soon among them. Tulagi's splinter fleet puttered about, joining the Fletcher and Drayton in rescue duty. Turning to pass over Tulagi, Mustin finally saw some large American ships. The Minneapolis and New Orleans were tied up close to shore, in the triage unit for wounded US cruisers, mangled and nearly unrecognisable. The New Orleans had had her forecastle about 150 feet of hull, removed clear back to her second turret by a single long lance. Its blast had triggered an adjoining magazine full of aircraft bombs and a large demolition charge, throwing a tower of flames and sparks twice as high as the foremast and turning the surrounding sea into a mass of flame. 182 men, including the entire crew of Turret 2, died by shock. As the ship turned right, a 50-yard length of the ship's own bow and forecastle tore away to port. One end of this heavy wreckage subducted under the keel, and the other bounced along the port side of the hull, tearing holes and wrecking the port inboard propeller. Sailors stationed aft believed they were running over the sinking carcass of the Minneapolis ahead. Confronted with this cataclysm, Captain Clifford H. Roper passed the order to abandon ship. However, the exec, Commander Whitaker F. Riggs, cancelled the order from his station in the rear of the ship and ordered the crew to lighten ship with an eye towards saving her. And that's just what they did. As the New Orleans nodded under by the bow, her broken nose ploughing up a pile of foam open to the sea, the damage control officer, Lieutenant Commander Hubert M. Hayter, and two subordinates, Lieutenant Richard A. Haynes and Ensign Andrew L. Foreman, remained at their post deep below in Central Station as it filled with toxic gas. When the air became unbreathable, Hayter gave his gas mask to an enlisted man who was suffering, then ordered all hands to evacuate. Two avenues of escape were available. One, a trunk that led from Central Station to the main deck, was blocked by flooding above, and Commander Hayter knew this. The other was a narrow, three-foot diameter steel tube that led upward to the wardroom. The plotting room crew scurried up through it, but when Hayter's turn came, he found that his shoulders were too broad to fit through the opening to the tube, which was reinforced with a thick steel collar. Ordering small men first, he returned to his desk and resumed his damage control duties. 
Haynes and Foreman remained with him in their increasingly untenable station until all three were asphyxiated. I wondered what he thought about in those final minutes. The ship's chaplain, Howell M. Forgey, would write, but I knew one thing, he was not afraid. Forward, at the site of the magazine explosion, a sailor named Gust Swenning, ship fitter second class, dove beneath the rising waters to locate and wrestle, closed an open watertight hatch that was causing the ship's sickbay compartment to flood. Badly injured in the initial explosion and struggling against heavy fumes, Swenning plunged into the dark, dangerous void at least five times, groping around until he finally closed the hatch. He remained on duty through most of the next day until, lungs poisoned by noxious elements, he died of pulmonary edema. Tied up to Tulagi's shore, the shattered hull of the New Orleans, truncated like a barge, lay draped in vegetation and cargo nets to hide it from enemy planes. It was an inglorious state for the ship whose chaplain, Commander Forgy, had coined the immortal phrase, praise the Lord, and pass the ammunition, while exhorting his ship's anti-aircraft gunners under attack at Pearl Harbor. The Minneapolis was alongside her too, similarly quaffed, the tug Bobolink serving as a pump house to keep her leaks from pulling her under. The crews of the broken ships hauled logs out of Tulagi's jungle to use as shoring for the forward compartments, and arranged with the marine chaplain ashore to bury the dead. The Pensacola was lucky to survive a battering by long lances. One of them shattered a full oil tank forward of turret three, tore the deck open above it and splashed a fiery wave of oil all over the after part of the ship, topside and below decks. With the afterfire main destroyed, her crew fought severe oil fires through the night, spreading carbon dioxide and foam compounds by hand as the ship was concussed by the deep cadence of eight-inch rounds detonating one by one, all 150 of them, in the after magazine. Wright might have expected better of his task force, given that he had surprised Tanaka by radar at long range. Three of his cruisers enjoyed the superb sight picture provided by the advanced SG radar, but Wright understood little of the combat capability of his enemy. In his December 9th after-action report, he concluded that the torpedoings of the Pensacola and Northampton had been lucky shots from submarines. The observed positions of the enemy surface vessels before and during the gun action makes it seem improbable that torpedoes with speed distance characteristics similar to our own could have reached the cruisers. Of course, Wright's torpedoes were nothing like those of the Japanese. Nearly a year into the war, and four months into a bitter campaign against Japanese surface forces, it seems incomprehensible that an American cruiser commander could be unaware of the enemy advantage in torpedo warfare. Norman Scott had called it specifically to Admiral Halsey's attention in October. The reports were there to be read. Before he rode to his death in the naval campaign for Java, the captain of the heavy cruiser Houston, Captain Albert H. Rooks, turned over to a colleague in Darwin an analysis he had written three weeks before the Pearl Harbor attack. It discussed at length Japan's prowess in torpedo combat and described their aggressively realistic night battle training. Their mastery of this specialty had been recommended to them by their experience in the Russo-Japanese War. When their diplomats agreed to constrain the size of their big gun fleet at the Washington Conference, the Japanese, like other navies, emphasized construction of their light forces. Rooks's pre-war report, which was based substantially on existing work of the Office of Naval Intelligence, never found its way into the battle plans. Not even Halsey grasped the superiority of Japanese surface ship torpedoes. After Tassafaronga, he endorsed Wright's view that the outcome had to have been the result of submarines. Norman Scott's October victory over a surprised Japanese force that failed to get its torpedoes into the water might have led the Americans to underestimate the weapon and place undue importance on gunnery. The reward for this ignorance was to see four proud ships, two of them fitted with the new radar that had proven decisive in more capable hands, picked off like mechanical ducks in a carnival shooting gallery, as Samuel Elliot Morrison would put it. Only the Honolulu, a sister ship to the Helena, had been able to avoid the burning wrecks ahead and zigzag clear of the torpedo water. The Minneapolis, New Orleans and Pensacola were put out of action for almost a year, Generous in defeat, Wright recommended all five of his cruiser captains for the Navy Cross, writing speciously that each had contributed greatly to the destruction of all enemy vessels within range.
he made the wildly inaccurate claim that Task Force 67 had sunk two light cruisers and seven destroyers, and praised the Northampton's captain for the speed with which his crew abandoned ship. The award to Captain Roper of the New Orleans would puzzle survivors of that ship. He did nothing heroic in any sense, one would write. Having crushed Wright's force, Tanaka faced a predicament comparable to the one his countryman Mikawa had faced in August. As he regrouped fifty miles from Guadalcanal's beach, he found that his ships were low on torpedoes. With only two destroyers fully loaded, he decided he was no longer in shape to risk another fight. He gave the order to return to Rabaul. Though his reputation was high among Americans, Tanaka would take lumps at home for declining to exploit his victory by delivering his supplies to the island. Here, as in August, the Americans, for all their failings, could interpret a ghastly result as a win. With the Imperial Japanese Army's transport force decimated and attrition to his destroyers reaching critical levels, Yamamoto was hard-pressed to provision the Imperial Army on Guadalcanal. The Japanese soldiers ashore were nourished by a withering vine. Of the 30,000 men serving there at the end of November, it was estimated that just 4,200 were fit to fight. One 3,000-man regiment reportedly had just 60 to 70 men capable of service. Admiral Ugaki called the cargo load of supplies landed in the last week of November, just chicken feed for 30,000 men. On December 3rd, 1,500 drums were delivered without heavy opposition from the American fleet, but only about a third of the drums were recovered by the troops. On December 7th, the Tokyo Express ran again, 11 destroyers under Captain Torajiro Sato. Planes from Henderson harassed them, and eight PT boats roared in after them too. It was an inconsequential skirmish, but the unexpected presence of enemy combat forces compelled the Japanese to withdraw. As new American naval forces steamed toward the South Pacific, a decisive victory was no longer within Yamamoto's grasp. Only after it had slipped from his fingers would he recognize the opportunity he had had within his reach in September and October. The time for the battle had passed. It had been preempted, if not won, by Scott, Callahan, Lee, and in his way, Wright. The US Navy's narrow victories of November allowed it to absorb a catastrophe like Tassafaronga. This defeat resembled the first one, the Battle of Savo Island, in that it shored up, at fearful cost, the position of the men on the island and allowed them to build up strength to fight in their own defence. Tanaka's final drum runs in December provoked no further large naval battles. No significant American formations were mustered to meet him, but he met fierce resistance from Henderson Field's aviators and the PT boats from Tulagi, which inflicted incremental losses on the Tokyo Express and forced Yamamoto to begin diverting submarines from hunting ships to running the blockade. On the night of the 9th, a pair of PT boats caught a Japanese sub on the surface three miles off Kamimbo Bay, towing a barge full of ammunition, food and medicine. They opened their throttles, rushed in and sank the I-3 with torpedoes. Credit for the kill went to the PT-59, captained by John M. Searles. This was quite a feather in the cap of those PT boat boys, said Lloyd Mustin. On December 11, Tanaka led what would be the final run of the Tokyo Express. The Mosquito fleet intercepted his force of nine destroyers between Cape Esperance and Savo Island. Tanaka's flagship, the Teruzuki, took a torpedo that detonated her depth charge stowage, sinking her. Fewer than one in five of the 1,200 drums thrown overboard reached the beach. Victory did not come by way of a shattering, decisive battle. It came through attrition, exacted relentlessly, night after night. Victory, when it came, did not march on parade. It announced itself more subtly, through a return to normalcy and a re-emergence of human behaviours that tended to disappear in periods of emergency, when the urgent struggle for survival concentrated minds. At the ice plant within the marine perimeter, some enterprising leathernecks made a robust black market selling a slushy grog made from papayas, limes, fruit juice and a surplus of torpedo fuel. When the fresh and generously supplied men of the Americal Division arrived, veteran riflemen suckered them mercilessly, selling to credulous souvenir seekers counterfeit Japanese battle flags manufactured at the parachute loft. On Red Beach that December, Discipline among the Beachmaster's boat crews teetered on the brink of breakdown. 
cargo ships carrying shipments of beer quickly found themselves swarmed by lighters jockeying to unload them. Nets swung from the booms of ammunition ships full of bombs and howitzer projectiles and machine gun ammunition and canned pineapple, but few boats volunteered to take them. Beer received higher priority. Delighted to find a Liberty ship carrying 30,000 cases, thieves loaded up their boats and spirited the suds up the beach to a secret depot that was quite secure from discovery, owing to its location several miles behind Japanese lines. A fiasco which would be rather deplorable if it weren't so humorous, Lloyd Mustin said. The boat crews knew it too, but by George they were going to land some beer in a private cache known only to them. The new commanding officer of American ground forces on Guadalcanal, General Patch, let the whole thing slide. He reportedly allowed fantastic quantities of surplus to pile up for off-the-books requisition. Just one in six cases of beer ferried ashore reached the quartermaster dump. Much as the army supply clerks might have protested, no complaints ever came from Patch, who seemed to regard the theft as a generous toast to his brothers-in-arms who had served so well since August. Under Patch, Guadalcanal would begin its transformation to a rear area base, a place dense with storage depots, hospitals, baseball games, fire trucks and ration dumps with beer stacked higher than two men could stand. There would be automotive maintenance shops, chapels, water carnivals and regattas with clowns on surfboards, forestry companies, performances by Bob Hope and Jerry Colonna, gardens tended by Japanese POWs, kennel shows and visits by Eleanor Roosevelt. An armed forces radio affiliate known as the Mosquito Network would flourish there. Its program supervisor, hired out of Hollywood, would create a musical segment called the Atabrine Cocktail Hour, promoting faithful use of the anti-malaria medication. Troops coming ashore would do so now as rehearsals for landings farther north and westward. The Imperial Japanese Navy had lost the ability to impose its will on the waters of Savo Sound. Ashore, the position of the 17th Army, desperately drawn in to hold small parts of the island's tangled and mountainous 2,500 square miles, was about as precarious as the initial US position. The whole colour of the war ashore on Guadalcanal was changing, and we could see it, said Lloyd Mustin. 